Well, I did say that I would, I would share a little bit. Hopefully this thing is on. A little bit about my, my last few weeks. And I was doing a devotion probably right around the time that I first got to D.C. And boy, it just hit at the perfect time. I was assigned with another agent from down in Texas. He flew up and we worked together. And the widow that we were assigned to, they said, as a last minute thing, oh, by the way, she, she pretty much wants to speak in Spanish. She doesn't know English that well. And my Spanish is like, I can tell jokes and a few other things, but <laughs> I, I, I have a tough time just carrying on conversation. Um, it takes me a little bit to transpose it in my mind. And so this young man we were with, um, he was part of peer support. He wasn't a chaplain. And so as I was talking to him, we were spending some time in the vehicle, and I said, boy, the Lord really put you here for a good reason because I would not have been able to connect with this widow the way you have because she speaks Spanish. And it turns out she did she did speak English and I was able to kind of mangle through most of that but um, this having this young man with us and his ability to communicate with her during times that she was really in a lot of emotional stress based on what had happened was just amazing. And so sitting in the vehicle, we got a chance to talk to him, this young man. It was actually kind of funny. He said, oh, I, I, my doctor said I need to eat more pure sugar. And I had brought a jug of maple syrup. I was going to give it to my boss. <laughs> but it was rolling around in the back of the truck. And in my mind, I kept thinking, this thing's going to break. And it's going to be the biggest mess in this <laughs> brand new $70,000 SUV. Could you imagine a big jug of maple syrup letting loose? <laughs> and so I'm thinking about this as he says, yeah, I need, my, my, my doctor says, I should probably have, instead of sugars, I should eat maple syrup. I heard it's really good. And I said, oh, hold on. I put the truck <laughs> and I came back and I handed him the jug of maple syrup and he just stared at it. He <laughs> and he said, does everybody from Vermont carry this? <laughs> so that was pretty funny. <laughs> But then, um, so as, as we were driving, he, I said, well, tell me about your faith. Do you have, do you have a faith? Because I said, how did you learn Spanish? And he said, I was a missionary. Wow. And um, he, was, he had gone as a missionary for the Mormon church. Mm. But he was really struggling with some of the legalisms, which we all do in churches. And we, it's a constant thing. We have to be watching because it sneaks in. Mm -hmm. And then we make it part of being a Christian before we realize, whoops, this, this is not something that really lines up with that. But he said, I don't know, kind of just struggling a little bit right now because I've been reading the Bible. And I don't find any of the legalism stuff there that, that we practice in our faith. I just keep finding about grace and the cross. And I said, hallelujah, that is, the, that is the ultimate thing to pull out of the word of God. If you're going to read it, that's it. And so I, he's like, well, you know, life really made some, some changes, some turns I, I wasn't expecting. But I'm here. I'm a, I'm, I'm a federal agent, which... You know, sometimes we all kind of wonder, how did we end up in this thing, you know? And, mm -hmm. and I said, well, you know what? You're seeking the Lord, and he has you right where he wants you. You're standing in your destiny right now. Mm -hmm. Because the way you reached out to this widow, that past, every step that you took, learning the Spanish language, going on a missionary trip, it's all coming to fruition right now because God has you in this moment and in this place and you're standing in your destiny. And he just, it's like, I, I just always thought maybe 
I just happened to be here. But, you know, I said, I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So that night I was, I went home and I was doing my devotion and I called him up really excited and I said, I want to tell you about a king named Josiah. And he was in the Old Testament. And he, he actually was like, where is this in the Bible? I want to read about it right away. Because I said, it's just a picture of you. You're seeking righteousness. You're kind of putting aside the legalisms and saying, I'm not thinking about a denomination. I'm not thinking about a certain set of walls. I want a direct connection to Jesus Christ. And I want to read about his grace and his mercy. And that's where I want to start. And it was, it was, then I did this devotion and I thought, Lord, you just, wow. Wow. So, we're going to get into Josiah. Now, I'm going to break this up into two weeks because there's no possible way again trying to get you out of here by four this afternoon. So, we're just going to get into a little bit of his story. But the, if you want to write this down and, and read it, he's actually mentioned in two different portions of Scripture, 2 Chronicles and 2 Kings. And so, he was a king in the, in the history of Israelites and the Jews, and there's there's so much there that I'm going to try to just hit some of the high parts, but this is his story. I'm going to get into his story, but just to give you a little bit of some of the verses that I really thought went along with his story. We go to Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in, can we all say that word? advance for us to do. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance. And sometimes we let our time direct how we think of God. He's not like that. He had your fingerprint on his mind from the beginning of eternity. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. What else do we have? I've mentioned this a lot. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God, that is you, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So that means the word of God equips you to go do what he wants you to do. And we're going to see this. So we're going to look at the landscape of uh, the story of Josiah. So he's one of the last kings in Judea. And basically, he, the Babylonians were coming. And they were going to plunder Judea. And he, was, he had a rough grandfather, a very rough father. And he made some decisions and said, I'm going to follow the Lord. I'm going to seek righteousness. When Josiah was born, his grandfather was Manasseh. He was the king. So he had been very, very wicked. He was an ungodly king in Judah. But late in his reign, the Assyrians came, and they literally dragged him out and took him to Babylon. So he was removed as the king. And there in his distress, he actually repented and prayed. Now this is Josiah's grandfather. And he was allowed to come back to Jerusalem where he finished his reign as a king. Now he kind of repented. So this was Josiah's grandfather. Upon returning, he actually commanded Judah to worship the Lord, and he attempted a restoration. He attempted it. Now we go into 2 Chronicles, and it, it tells the story all about the grandfather, the father, and then Josiah. What I couldn't help wondering was, Josiah made such a difference, and we're going to see that. But who was praying for him? Somebody that maybe isn't even mentioned here in the Word of God. There were some people in his life that were guiding him, Josiah, and, and helping him lead a godly life. Sometimes, God just requires us to put the prayer in. 
but we don't always get to see what comes out of it. But we have to have the hope, and that is just a truth in our heart, that hope that the Lord is going to do what, he's, what we pray for him to do. And we, we talked about prayer and how we, we literally unlock heaven when we're praying for somebody. So, it kind of failed to take root. So Manasseh is the, the grandfather. Now, um, he has a son who was jo uh, Josiah's father. And he was very, very wicked. He, he kind of said, nope, everything Manessa did, we're not going to do that. And he did some really, really bad stuff. Now, we talked about the whole tabernacle and the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant. During the reign of the grandfather and especially the father, they actually brought false idols into the tent. False gods. Now, we talked about how important that that tent was. It was the, the place that God dwelt. So, what were the two things you couldn't do with the ark? You couldn't touch it. You're not supposed to look at it either. Yeah, it's, it's biblical. You're not, well, you're not, when it's open, you're not supposed to look at it. As a matter of fact, in the Raiders of the Lost Ark movie, when Harrison Ford is tied, he says, don't look at it. They did their homework when they made that movie. That when the Nazis opened the lid, Harrison Ford turns his face and says, don't look at it. So, the ark is actually carried off and kind of the Levites take it and they're protecting it. Because they can't, they can't leave it in a place that has now false gods within it. In the study of that tabernacle and how important that was, it kind of even gives me goosebumps thinking of somebody dragging a false god into that and that's what Manasseh and, and his son, who was Josiah's father, when they did that, they were really desecrating the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. Have you ever witnessed to somebody and they're like, I believe in Buddha, I believe in Muhammad, and I believe in Jesus. I don't, I make sure I got all the bases covered. <laughs> I've heard that so many times. And it's like, okay, so... I kind of, as I was reading through this, I thought, you know, I can kind of see Amon was Josiah's father. Manasseh was the grandfather. He started the process of, of worshiping the Lord because he went through a big trial in his life, got down to his last breath, and then he repented and he attempted it. Then Amon came in, that was his son, and really messed things up. He's the one who actually started bringing the false gods into the tabernacle. So the Levites took the ark, and there's the last time that the ark is mentioned is with Josiah. So when archaeologists try to figure out where it is today, they go to Josiah, the story of Josiah, because it's the last time the ark is seen biblically. But that I'm going to save for next week because I definitely don't have enough time. So now Amon, this is Josiah's father, he returned to practicing the wickedness and idol worship of his youth. He brought back all the idols that his grandfather had taken away when he repented. And before long, some of his servants, they rose up and they killed him. He made it like three years as the king and just totally desecrated everything of God. So Josiah, now this is our star of the show we're talking about today. He's about in second grade when his father gets killed. Second grade. The people went after Ammon's assassins and they killed them and then Josiah became king. He's only about eight years old. Now I remember in the military, if you make it to a chief, that's in the Navy, that's when you're a chief man, people get out of your way. <laughs> and I remember there was this kid, he was like 22 years old, and he was just a rock star when it came to military things, and he made it to chief at 22 years old. And I remember these older, two older chiefs standing there one time, and they had the big wad of chew in their mouth. <laughs> They're like, that could have never worked with me. If I'd have become a chief when I was 22 years old, the whole entire U.S. 
U.S. government would be upside down because you have a lot of authority when you're a chief. And they're like, I could have never done that at that age. This kid was 22. Josiah is eight, eight years old. So how many of you could imagine basically becoming a king and making those decisions at eight years old? But it's amazing because there's something in his heart that he wants. Now remember, his father desecrated the temple, what they knew of the temple. And even the holy scrolls were gone. There was, he didn't have a Bible that he could go to and say, oh hey, it says in Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy. He didn't have that. It was gone. They thought destroyed. And so he just had this urging in his heart. We call that general revelation. When God just pulls at you and you know there's something I need to pursue the Lord. And all these other idols, something's not right there. And I believe it's because someone was praying for him. Praying for him hard. Maybe the people were meeting in their little home churches and they were praying, please Lord bring us a king. There was probably a small remnant. So whoever influenced Josiah, he was a godly, faithful king. In 2 Kings 23, 25, it says, Now before him there was no king like him, who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might, according to the law of Moses, nor after him did any arise like him. Wow! Isn't that something to have that said of you in the word of God? And the, the whole world was against him. The whole world. <clears throat> Can you imagine walking in to wherever you're given the authority, whether whatever jobs you have, whatever family situation, and everybody is against you? But God says, I have you there for a reason. There's going to be some tough times coming because they're not going to like what you're going to bring to them. So, it's quite a description to have that written about him. He was a rare find among the kings, and he found himself in a period of unparalleled idolatry. His reign, again, is recorded in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. So, we take a look at his life. We're going to turn to 2 Chronicles 34, 1, and I'm just going to go through a couple of verses. He was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. And his death basically came at the beginning of the Babylonians when they just came in and, and took everything. But because of his reign and because of his heart for God, God allowed Israel to be safe during his reign. But that's a whole other sermon again. So, eight years old. I still can't, I have a tough time even getting over that. Now we're going to look at verse 3, 2 Chronicles 34, 3. And in the eighth year of his reign, so he was eight years old when he took over. In the eighth year of his reign, he is now 16 years old. And now, when he was eight, he had this prompting in his heart, this thing that was just naturally happening. Now he turns 16. In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. I hate to keep saying this, but that's another sermon. Because his father was Amon. His grandfather was Manasseh. So there's a sermon in why he sought his father David. But that's, again, got it. Not, we don't have all day here. So the word here is interesting. We'll get into that. He was 16 years old here. And it makes a point of him saying that he started to seek God even deeper. Deeper. What are most 16-year-old boys interested in? Girls. Girls! <laughs> yeah. Cars, sports, music, entertainment, fun. I was the car guy. Um, I was going to work with this guy one morning when I was 16, and we pulled up, and there was a Trans Am. And it had the big Prager rims on it back then. And I remember 
just looking at it, and and the guy and I was sitting with a kid next to me, and he says, "Wow, check that out." And I said, "Man, that is really something." <laughs> and he's like, "Yeah." The car drove away, and I said, "Even the rims, those are nice rims." And he's like, "What rims?" I said, "Man, you didn't see the rims? It was the best part of the car." He says. I was looking at the blonde in the front seat. <laughs> I said, I didn't even see a woman in the car. I didn't even see who was driving it. So, so we all had our things that we were very, very interested in when we were 16 years old. His father certainly didn't pursue God. So didn't this mean that Josiah, maybe he shouldn't have pursued God either? So, you know, I hear that a lot. My family's messed up, so I guess I'm always going to be messed up too. You couldn't come from a more dysfunctional family than what Josiah came from. Uh, the Bible is filled with dysfunction. But he had this urging in him, and he followed it. Remember, with no scripture, no scripture whatsoever. So, but he overcame his past. And what a past to overcome. Two people in your lineage that were the vilest of vile when it comes to desecrating the Lord. A father who was eventually assassinated, he didn't have very good role models to follow. Our past sometimes does overshadow us. And I believe right now there's maybe some of us that may even be struggling saying, this past is just, I'm not where God wants me and I'm so far off I might as well give up. But I've used the illustration of, and I did this, this was a great illustration in Washington, D.C., one night I was trying to take the widow home and I kept missing the exit. And I went around and around and around to a point where, and then we would start talking and I would sail right past it again. It was this big, long journey. And then one of the journeys, somebody was in an accident, like a 15 minute trip took me an hour and a half because I kept missing the exit. And we, we had a if anybody's ever seen the vacation movies where the guy gets stuck in the traffic circle and he keeps yeah. saying, look kids, Big Ben. Hey, there's Big Ben. I, our joke of the whole entire trip there was, look, there's the Pentagon. <laughs> hey guys, there's the Pentagon. And we just kept passing the Pentagon. I'm like, I can't get back on the road. But when we make those wrong turns, the, the Lord is just like one of those navigators. We may make a few wrong turns, but he's still going to get us to what our destiny is when we're seeking him. When we're paying attention at all to that little road thing that they GPS, it's going to route us back and it's going to put us back where we need to be. And it was neat because I got to share this with this young man that was with me. I said, God has you right where he wants you. You're in your destiny right now. So realize that. Sometimes when we think, oh, so messed up so bad, I'll just help out a little here, but this isn't my destiny. I should have been somewhere else. I should have been doing this. I should have been doing that. But you know what? Just seek God's righteousness. And we're going to see that. So our past overshadows us sometimes. We're hurting some of the things from our past, some of the things that were done to us, some of the things that weren't done to us as we were raised. Sometimes we think we're missing out on God because we've just stepped too far. The hurts past and present seem like barriers that we just can't break through. But Josiah did it. He's the ultimate picture of just seek God and all the dysfunction, just set it there behind you and say, Lord, I just want to seek you. I want to seek your righteousness. Sometimes the wounds don't properly heal up until we really start to seek the Lord. And sometimes even in our midst of seeking the Lord, we go back to the past and we dwell on that too much. Maybe we start to think that God desires all to be saved except me. Has anybody ever struggled with that moment in their life when they think, well, I, I may not have quite made it where God wants me to be, and, but in 1 Timothy, 2, 1 through 4, it says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior. Who wants, what's that word? All people. All people to be 
saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. There's no doubt there. Every word in the Bible is important. Back to Josiah. So at 16, he begins to seek God. Four years later, he begins to take action and purge out the idols in Judah and Israel. So, first, Second Chronicles 34, 3. And in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. In his twelfth year, he began to purge, purge Judah and Jerusalem of high places, as sheriff holes and idols. He purged them. It says, under his direction, the altars of the veils were torn down. Next week, I'm going to get into that word veil. I'm going to really, we're going to have a discussion all the way back to the original Hebrew of what that means. And you're going to be amazed. Sometimes we take when they says veils were torn down. We don't quite understand what that is. But next week, I guarantee you will. He cut into pieces the incense altars that were above them and smashed the astral poles of the idols. These he broke to pieces and scattered over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He burned the bones of the priests on the altars so that he purged Judah and Jerusalem. That is, in the towns of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Sinian, as far as Nabakai, and in the ruins around them. He tore down the altars and the Asherah poles and crushed the idols to powder yes. and cut to pieces all the incense altars throughout Israel. Then he went back to Jerusalem in the 18th year of Josiah's reign to purify the land and the temple. He sent Shaphan, son of Azaliah, and Messiah, the ruler of the city, with Joan, son of Joas, the recorder, to repair the temple of the Lord his God. A lot of really long names there. And I, as I was reading through this, you think that was the popular thing for him to do? I'm sure a lot of people loved him, but I bet a lot of people hated him for what he was doing. Because there's probably some people that are like, I grew up worshiping that false idol. I grew up doing this and that. And now he is, he's, he's, he's not just, he didn't go in and say, um, we should really be concentrating on God. Let's take this idol and set it over here. Sometimes we do that. We put it in the closet, the thing that the Lord wants us to get rid of it. We sweep it under the carpet. And I always think of the guy who sold his house. And a, a bidder came in and really gave him a low price. And he thought, well, okay, he says, I'll, I'll, take, I'll, I'll sell the house to you. But I want to keep this nail. There's a nail on a post over here. And I want to keep that nail, can I? And the guy said, was like, yeah, sure, I'm buying this house. I'm getting it really cheap. You can keep the nail. So he moves into the house. The new person does and the person who sold the house, the man knocks on the door late one night. And the new owner opens the door and he says, what's up? And he says, oh, I came to hang my hat on the nail. <laughs> and then the next morning at 6 a.m., he wakes the man up and he says, I came to get my hat off my nail. And this goes on and on and on for six or eight months. And finally one morning, the new owner swings the door open and says, okay, how much for the nail? <laughs> <laughs> and he paid a lot. <laughs> and that's what happens when we just kind of put it off to the side. The Lord said, if it's not of me, you need to get rid of it. You need to purge it. He burned it. He eradicated it. So, I was reading this. And I saw Psalms 37, 23. The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. And you can see this in Josiah's life. He still doesn't even have the word of God. He removed the idols. He removed and he repaired the house of the Lord. He started seeking God when he was 16. Then when he's 20 years old, he took it to the next level and began removing all the idol worship. There were so many high places in the cities that the prophet Jeremiah, when he talked about it, this is in 228, Jeremiah, where then are the gods you made for yourselves? Let them come if they can save you when you are in trouble, for you have as many gods as you have towns, O Judea. That's the prophet prophesied as Josiah was coming into town and doing this. 
You imagine the work that he had to do, probably years of removing the idols that, the, that they had built. Now, he's 26 years old and he starts restoring the temple. It was then while they were restoring the temple that a man named Hilkiah, who was always by Josiah's side, found the book of the law. He found the word of God. A lot of theologians believe that it was Genesis, Exodus, Genesis, Exodus and probably the book of Deuteronomy. Or some of them think it was just Deuteronomy. But it was gone. It was lost up to that point. And when they start to fix the temple, can you imagine when they put the false gods in there, they probably said, get rid of everything. And maybe one brave person took a scroll and tucked it under something and said, I'm going to make sure that the word of God somehow stays here. And now he finds it. <coughs> this, I'm going to read this to you. This is the story. In the 18th year of his reign, King Josiah sent the secretary, a lot of names, to the temple of the Lord. He said, go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, and have him get ready the money that has been brought into the temple of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have collected from the people. Have them entrusted to the men appointed to supervise the work in the temple. That's another sermon. And have these men pay the workers who repair the temple of the Lord, the carpenters, the builders, the masons. Have them purchase timber and dress stone to repair the temple. This is very specific because he wants it put back the way it should be. He wasn't compromising at all. But they need not account for the money entrusted them because they are honest in their dealings. Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan, who read it. Then Shaphan, the secretary, went to the king, who's Josiah, and reported to him, Your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the workers and supervisors at the temple. Then Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. When the king, Josiah, heard the words of the book of the Lord, he tore his robes. That was, a, that was a mourning. They did that when they had a sense of deep regret and hurt and pain and mourning. And he tore his clothes. Because that law that they should have been living, they should have been just embracing and living in, had been hidden. And because he now decides to rebuild the temple, remove the idols, and rebuild it the way the Lord wants it. And remember, what are we? We are temples of the Lord. Each one of us. So when we decide to remove the idols and rebuild it the way the Lord wants it, the word is going to come alive. You're going to find something you may have thought you lost. God's law reveals God's will as well as God's wrath against sin. The law of God shows the path of righteousness and pronounces God's blessing on the righteousness. It also reveals the way of wickedness and pronounces God's curse upon sin. Now Josiah gets this word and he's, he's now reading it for the first time. This thing that was welling up in his heart, general revelation, and now he has the word of God which theologians call special revelation. And you can get in a 1,500-year debate on whether you can go to heaven with general revelation or if you need special revelation. But that's a whole other thing. So, so now you know the difference. That welling up, that one, I need to seek God. General revelation. Now he finds the word of God. Now it's opened up to him. Special revelation. He was known for rebuilding the church. He knew Israel's history. He believed God's word, and he took it personally. That's the whole thing about him ripping the clothes. We talk about the fact that each one of us has to personally know the Lord, and then we're a whole collection of ones. And that's what that tearing of the clothes, it was a personal thing to him when he found the word. Now he's known for rebuilding the church. Next week, we're going to get into the fact that he brought the Ark of the Covenant back, back out of hiding. It's time to battle. He battled with the enemy. He battled against the lies and the deceit. And he was getting rid of legalism. It's, it's just an incredible story. 
even the altar of Bethel, the high place made by Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who had caused Israel to sin. Now this is what Jer uh, Josiah is removing. Even that altar and high place he demolished. He burned the high place to the ground into powder and burned the Asherah poles also. Then Josiah looked around, and when he saw the tombs that were there in the hillside, he had the bones removed from them and burned on the altar to defile it. In accordance with what? The word of the Lord. Proclaimed by the man of God who foretold these things. The king asked, What is this tombstone I see? The people of the city said, It marks the tomb of the man of God who came from Judea and pronounced against the altar of Bethel the very things you have done. So he goes up on this mountain, and he's like, okay, they did some idol worship up here. We need to just cleanse this mountain. We need to get rid of it. And he starts doing that. In the process, he finds a grave. And he says, now what is this? And it's, what I find is funny is that there's probably somebody standing there like, oh, that's, uh, that's this prophet guy. Like 300 years ago, he came up here and said, you were going to come up here and do this. Can you, can you just get the depth of that? Can you imagine as Josiah is standing there, and sometimes we wonder, am I in the will of God? Am I not in the will of God? And he's probably dealing with a lot of backlash, a lot of enemy resistance. And now he's standing there, and this prophet says, yeah, that, that's the prophet who said, you, know, you were going to come up and, and do this. And he didn't know that. Nobody ever told him that. Why was he on top of that mountain? Because the word of God said you need to remove all the idols. He now had the word. Now it's special revelation. And now he opens up the word and becomes alive. And now he's like, I'm going to pursue every idol that's on a mountaintop, anywhere I can find one, and it's going to get destroyed. I'm going to pursue God's righteousness. He pursues God's righteousness, gets to the top of the mountain, finds the grave, and the prophet says, or the, the person that's with him says, yeah, there's a prophet buried there. And he's the guy that said you were going to do all this. Prophesied three centuries ago. <laughs> and this is what I told that young man that was riding with me. I said, just like Josiah, no matter where you are in life, if you seek God's righteousness for your temple, you will find yourself right in your destiny. So if you're wondering, if you're searching a little bit right now, in any step that you make, pursue God's righteousness. Let the word speak to you, and God's going to give you part of your next step. Remember the word for step? Upward journey? Aliyah. He's going to give you that next step in your journey. When you pursue righteousness in the smallest of ways, it's just incredible. Mm. He had no idea of this prophecy. The prophecy is in 1 Kings 13, 2 through 3. 1 Kings 13, 2 through 3, if you want to read about it. It doesn't even mention the name of the prophet. It just says a prophet came. It actually says, yep, this guy's going to go up. He's going to going to go to the top of the mountain. He's going to do these things. And then the prophet dies and they bury him on top of the mountain. Josiah has no idea about this story. None. He came there that day simply to do the will of God. And yet he did exactly as was prophesied centuries before he existed. This is how God brought Josiah to his destiny. So how do you fulfill the destiny for your life? He followed the will of God that he knew from the Word of God. The Word of God didn't tell him exactly where to go or when to go, but he ended up in the exact right place at the exact right time. I often think, when you think, well, how do you know it was the right time? Because there was a person standing next to him <laughs> that knew who it was. Now think of that whole entire story. It's not in the Word of God, but it must have been quite a story that they handed down, maybe in secret during the times that the idol worship was going on and they were still meeting together and worshiping the Lord. 
And somehow he goes up to this mountain and the person standing next to him knows the story from three centuries ago. So that's the right time in the right place, folks. And he knew nothing about it. This will also work in your life as well. The Word of God will give you the overall direction and the leading in your life. And as you follow the direction of the Word, it will lead you to walk in the exact and specific will of God, which is your destiny. You see, the Scriptures, they don't focus on finding the will of God that you don't know, but rather the Scriptures focus on obeying the will of God that you do know. When you obey the will of God that you do know, you will find yourself standing in the destiny that you didn't know. Boy, I'm, as I'm saying that, I'm realizing <laughs> it came out right. I'm not sure I can say it again. <laughs> it's amazing how God works. Follow what God has revealed to you, and it will lead you into that which was not revealed to you. I'm going to say that again. I want you to follow what God has revealed to you. And it will lead you into that which was not revealed to you. By following his righteousness. And as it was with Josiah, you will find yourself standing in the high place. In the exact place, in the exact time that was appointed for your life. Before the foundations of the world were ever put into place. By obeying the revealed will of God, you will be led into the unrevealed will of God, your destiny. I'm going to just close with Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. The more we submit to the will of the Lord, the more we seek his righteousness. So my challenge to you is, in some way, shape, or form, in the next week, in some portion of your life, so maybe you get up and you do some devotions, but then you go to work and maybe you have a rough time in a certain part of the day at work. Take that moment and say, how can I seek God's righteousness right now? Next week, we're going to actually look at Baal and what that means right down to the Hebrew. And we're going to find out that it basically means anything but God. Anything but God. So, I'll give you a little hint. The Old Testament word for Baal became the New Testament word Beelzebub. So, concentrate and say, Lord... What part of today can I seek your righteousness out more? And in the frustrating moment that you're having in life right then and there, God's going to reveal your destiny. Amen. That's good. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let's just sing a song and close. And, uh, I have to tell you, sometimes God really works on my heart just as much as anything else. And I wandered around my house last night in tears and shouting at some point, praising the Lord, back in tears. But that's the way the Lord works. If you trust Him with the Word, and if you say, Lord, you reveal something to me, <laughs> He is going to change your life. When you get in that moment in time when you're a little frustrated, say, what can I do right now to seek your righteousness, Lord? And you're going to see that that frustration is going to turn. And you'll find you're right where you need to be. Let's sing the cross as the final word. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Sorrow may come in the darkest night, and the cross has the final word. There's nothing stronger 
Jesus. 